Some troubling news out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Four former LSU football players arrested for marijuana possession. Welcome into the Sporting News Studios. I'm Tom Vandervoort, sitting alongside Matt Crossman. And Matt, before we get to you, we're going to turn to another college football writer on our staff out in the field, Steve Greenberg, to tell us exactly what happened in Baton Rouge the other day. Police uh, found Tyran Matthew and three other uh, former LSU teammates, including Jordan Jefferson, the starting quarterback last year, in Matthew's home, and uh, there, there was marijuana discovered in the possession of each of those players, and uh, and one of them, uh, Derek Bryant, faces the most serious charges of all. He uh, intent to distribute. He had much more marijuana uh, on him than than the others, and uh, but all four were arrested. And Steve, obviously, the highest profile among these four players is Tyron Matthew. What do you see his future if there is one in college football? I don't see how LSU will will welcome him back into the football fold. You know, he's been in school, not uh, with the team, but enrolled as a student, hoping to work his way back onto the Tigers roster. Les Miles has been uh, open to it in the sense that he hasn't said no publicly. Uh, that's all before this uh, latest event. I don't think there's any way uh, Matthew plays at LSU again. And, and, you know, could he play somewhere else at the college level, maybe stepping down a level or something? Theoretically, he could, but I don't know if any program would, would take him now, Tom. And, and uh, it may be that, you know, he is draft eligible. If, he, if he's in school three years, he can just go to the NFL, which is what most people thought he would do before. It was a surprise that he went back to, to LSU. It was a surprise to many. It was a surprise to me. Uh, I think now if he wants to play football, the NFL is the likeliest avenue. All right, Steve, thank you so much. And, Matt, I, I turn to you now because you actually went and spent a lot of time with Tyron Matthew down in Louisiana. You got to know him quite a bit. And just what was your first reaction when you heard this news? Well, sadness. Uh, just that he, he keeps he keeps making poor decisions. And just you wonder, just there, there's been so much going on in his life, uh, so much pain and so much sadness that he just he keeps adding to it. And I... You know, uh, it's a heartbreaking story. It's, he's just had a, he's had a tough life so far, and he's making it worse. Well, a couple words when I read your story and talked to you about it earlier. A couple words that pain was one word, and then trust or lack thereof yeah. kind of came out of it. Yeah, you know, he was uh, he's from New Orleans. And he was raised by mostly by his aunt and uncle, a little bit by his grandfather, uh, but still sort of had a relationship with his mom, although she had given him up for adoption, and his dad uh, has been in a pr prison essentially his whole life. Uh, for murder, and but he has other brothers and sisters that are still with his mom. So he's sort of like, what? Why are they being raised by her and I'm not? And it's a, frankly, it's a central issue in, in his life that he can't resolve. That he feels, you know, I was I was saying this on Twitter earlier today, and I I said it in the story too that he he feels like there's there's nobody who loves him unconditionally, and it just. It just breaks my heart to hear a kid talk like that. You know, it's interesting. One thing you said that I saw on Twitter, you said that. Just calling someone mom was awkward and painful for him at first. It, it took, and that really struck me because it's something that most of us, I believe, take for granted. Yeah, I mean, can you I mean, think about this? He can remember learning to say, he was so old when he started to call somebody mom and dad that he can remember learning to say it. Mm. And, you know, I don't, I don't even know what to add to that. It, it's so sad. So where do you see his future? I mean, do you have a, a feeling about about the I, I I don't. Frankly, I hope he I hope someone convinces him that his identity is not as a football player. I hope someone convinces him that getting back to the football field is, you know, goal number two hundred and seventy five on his list. And and number one is getting himself straightened around, uh getting himself centered. Uh and you know, I don't frankly I don't care if he ever plays football again. I, and I, I I wish it were possible for him not to care either. Do you think football for him has been a refuge or has it been a burden? Boy, that's a good question. It, it, it's a refuge, but I, I think it's also a, a tether to that. You know, we, we talked a lot when I was with him in New Orleans. Uh, he described, you know, playing defensive back that uh, the coaches on video will, will draw a box around the ball and that the defensive back's job is to be in that box in order to make plays. And that's how he plays defensive back. And he told me then that th that, that was analogous to how he was trying to live his life, that that a box, the box of right decisions, basically the box of surrounding yourself with right people, the box of, of doing right things. That's how he was trying to live right. his life. And the it was, straight and narrow, essentially. Yeah, and you thought, man, he, he's he, he's got it. If he can only stay in that box, and he hasn't been able to. There you go. And another thing you said that I agree with is just because he did 
the wrong thing in this case doesn't mean we can't have some empathy for him. For Matt Crossman, I'm Tom Vandervoort. Thanks for watching.